When Naomi's not writing these big, bold books, she serves as a reporter for Rolling Stone magazine. She's a contributing editor at, uh, at Harper's and a columnist for The Nation and the London-based Guardian. She's also a wife and the mother of a little boy. Please give a warm Berkeley welcome to Naomi Klein. It's so good to be here. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you, Jason, for that lovely introduction. Um, I want to thank everybody who has made this evening possible, everybody at KPFA and um, Earth Island Journal, and especially my friends at Movement Generation, who um, in so many ways um, have been my teachers, um, uh, an incredible group, uh, not just of activists, but really of intellectuals, of organic intellectuals, who are theorizing um, this uh, climate justice movement into being, along with so many other people around the world. Um, and I'm just so grateful um, for their work and so grateful um, that they are here tonight and that you're going to be hearing from a couple of, uh, of, of fantastic speakers, Cynthia and Quinton, who um, are, going to, uh, are going to be uh, speaking after me. And um, I, usually I don't do this, but I was, I'm going to start my talk actually by just reading uh, a little passage from the book. Um, I don't usually do this, this kind of reading, but I'm, I'm going to do it in this case because I think it, it, it for me, it sets the stage a little bit of um, the, the, some of the personal stakes um, when we engage with an issue this big. Um, so this is, a, this is a short passage from the introduction to um, This Changes Everything. What gets me most are not the scary scientific studies about melting glaciers, the ones I used to avoid. It's the books I read to my two-year-old. Looking for a moose is one of his favorites. It's about a bunch of kids that really, really, really want to see a moose. Have you ever seen a moose, they ask? They search high and low, through a forest, a swamp, in brambly bushes, up a mountain, for a long-legged, bulgy-nosed, branchy antler moose. The joke is that there are moose hiding on every page. Um, in the end, the animals all come out of hiding and the ecstatic kids proclaim, we've never, ever, ever, ever seen so many moose. Now, my son loves this book. And on about the 75th reading, it suddenly hit me. He might never see a moose. I tried to hold it together. I went back to my computer and began to write about my time in northern Alberta, tar sands country, where members of the Beaver Lake Cree First Nation told me about how the moose had changed. One woman described finding a moose on a hunting trip only to discover that the flesh had already turned green. I heard a lot about strange tumors too, which locals assumed had to do with the animals drinking water contaminated by tar sands toxins. But mostly, I heard about how the moose were simply gone, and not just in Alberta. Rapid climate change turns North Woods into moose graveyard, reads a May 2012 headline in Scientific American. A year and a half later, the New York Times was reporting that one of Minnesota's two moose populations had declined from 4,000 in the 1990s to just 100 today. Will he ever see a moose? Then the other day, I was slain by a miniature board book called Snuggle Wuggle. It involves different animals cuddling with each posture given a ridiculously silly name. How does a bat hug, it asks. Topsy-turvy, topsy-turvy. For some reason, my son reliably cracks up at this page. I explain that topsy-turvy means upside down because that's the way bats sleep. But all I can think about are the reports of some 100,000 dead and dying bats raining down from the sky in the midst of record-breaking heat across part of Queensland, Australia 
whole colonies devastated. Will he ever see a bat? I knew I was in trouble the other day when I found myself bargaining with starfish. Red and purple ones are ubiquitous on the rocky coast of British Columbia where my parents live, where my son was born, where I have spent about half my adult life. They're always the biggest kid pleasers because you can gently pick one up and give it a really good look. This is the best day of my life, my seven-year-old niece Miriam visiting from Chicago proclaimed after a long afternoon spent in the tide pools. But in the fall of 2013, stories began to appear about a strange wasting disease that was causing starfish along the Pacific coast to die in the tens of thousands, termed the sea star wasting syndrome. Multiple species were disintegrating alive, their vibrant bodies melting into distorted globs with legs falling off and bodies caving in. Scientists were mystified. As I read these stories, I caught myself praying for the invertebrates to hang in for just one more year, long enough for my son to be amazed by then. Then I doubted myself. Maybe it's better if he never sees a starfish at all. Certainly not like this. When fear like that used to creep through my armor of climate change denial, I would do my utmost to stuff it away, change the channel, click past it. Now I try to feel it. It seems to me that I owe it to my son, just as we all owe it to ourselves and to one another. But what should we do with this fear from coming, that comes from living on a planet that is dying, made less alive every day? First, accept that it won't go away, that it is a fully rational response to an unbearable reality. Next, use it. Fear is a survival response. Fear makes us run, it makes us leap, it makes us act superhuman. But we need somewhere to run to. Without that, fear is just paralyzing. So the real trick, the only hope, really, is to allow the terror of an unlivable future to be balanced and soothed by the prospect of building something much better than many of us had previously dared hope. Yes, there will be things we will lose, Luxuries some of us will have to give up, whole industries that will disappear. And it's too late to stop climate change from coming. It is already here, and increasingly brutal disasters are headed our way no matter what we do. But it's not too late to avert the worst. And there is still time to change ourselves so that we are far less brutal to one another when those disasters strike. And that, it seems to me, is worth a great deal. Because the thing about a crisis this big, this all-encompassing, is that it changes everything. It changes what we can do, what we can hope for, what we can demand from ourselves and our leaders. It means there is a whole lot of stuff we have been told is inevitable that simply cannot stand. And it means there is a whole lot of stuff we have been told is impossible that has to start happening right away. Can we pull it off? All I know is that nothing is inevitable. Nothing except that climate change changes everything. And for a very brief time, the nature of that change is still up to us. So that is the end of the reading portion of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. So I called the book This Changes Everything because I think it's important to start the discussion from the premise that um, we have passed the point where non-radical options are on the table. We only have radical options in front of us. If we stay on the road we're on, the road that is sometimes called business as usual, Scientists tell us, and also some of the most conservative institutions in the world, like the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, PricewaterhouseCooper, tell us that we are on a road leading us to four to six degrees of warming Celsius. Six degrees is 10.7 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Um, that changes everything about our physical world, that much we know. We don't know exactly what it looks like because all the climate models break down. Um, 
but at that point, but we know we're talking about whole cities disappearing, whole countries disappearing, major crop failure, I don't want to get all apocalyptic on you. We're talking about everything changing, about our physical world, and all we have to do to get to that place is nothing. Just keep on keeping on. They call that business as usual. Now, there are people out there who will tell you that we can avert some of the worst of that, but in order to do that, we have to engage in radical engineering interventions in our climate system. Um, spray sulfur into the stratosphere to try to dim the sun, um, or fertilize our oceans to try to trap carbon. Needless to say, there are some risks associated with these ideas. Um, these are radical options. Um, we can avert these outcomes. It is not too late to give ourselves a really good shot at preventing catastrophic climate change. But these also involve radical changes. Changes, radical changes to our political and economic system. Reformism, tweaking around the edges, that time has passed. There is, as Michael Mann says, the Penn State climate scientist who wrote The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, a procrastination penalty to doing nothing about climate change. That's the nature of greenhouse gases. They build up in the atmosphere. If you let them build up at the same time as scientists are warning you for two and a half decades that there will be disastrous outcomes, then you then have to cut them so quickly um, that the impacts are radical. And that's where we are right now, that we need to cut globally our emissions by 6% a year if we want to hold on to a 50, 50 chance of staying below 2 degrees warming Celsius. Um, now, the trick is that's not 6 degrees everywhere, 6% six, 6 everywhere in the world, um, because our governments have agreed to a principle of um, that we need to respond to this with some sense of equity, historical responsibility, which means that the countries that got a 200-year head start on emitting carbon have to start cutting first. Um, so that means, um, according to leading climate scientists at the Tyndall Center in England, um, that in countries like the United States and the country where I live, Canada, we need to start cutting our emissions by six, by eight, sorry, eight to 10% a year. Um, that is not compatible with an economic system built on perpetual growth. Um, and that's where we get into these deep challenges. Uh, and um, we can talk more about that later. Um, but this is, this is the premise that, that I start with. Um, and that's why I chose the title of the book, because I think we need to start our discussions from this point, as opposed to pretending that it's still 1992, um, and we're still talking about these sort of gentle tweaks that can get us out of this. There is a procrastination penalty. Um, emissions are up 61% since our governments started negotiating to lower our emissions. So. I see this book as a sequel to The Shock Doctrine <laughs> um, in a very real way. And, and I'll tell you wh wh why, why I see it that way. Um, the Shock Doctrine, is, as Jason said, and, and, and as many of you know, is a book about how our elites have advanced a very radical, uh, fundamentalist version of capitalism in the midst of crises. Um, in, in, the, in the aftermath of major shocks, wars, coups, natural disasters. And the book begins and ends with Hurricane Katrina, which um, for me always was the most devastating illustration um, of this tactic, um, the, the baldest illustration of this tactic. Um, and I think it's worth talking about a little bit because it has to do with climate change um, and it also has to do with what is making climate change worse. In the shock doctrine I describe Katrina uh, and its impact on New Orleans in particular as a collision between heavy weather and weak infrastructure. 
the weak bones of the state, weakened by decades of neglect. Um, so you have this storm, supercharged perhaps by warming oceans. We know that hurricanes are getting stronger because of warming ocean temperatures. Um, colliding with not just neglected levees, um, but a state, a government that essentially wasn't home. I mean, that was, if we think back to that moment, what was most shocking was that FEMA couldn't seem to find New Orleans for five days, right? Um, and it illustrated what I just called in the book, a little bit controversially, climate apartheid. Um, because it was so racialized, it was so much about who had resources and who depended um, on the state. And if you had resources, if you had money, you could get in your car and drive out of New Orleans and check into a hotel. Um, but if you were relying on your government to have any kind of evacuation plan, any kind of system in place, you were abandoned um, on the roof holding signs that said help. Um, and that, and, th and then came the disaster capitalists. And in the book, um, I quote from this document um, that was the minutes from a meeting that took place in Washington, D.C., two weeks after the storm hit while New Orleans was still underwater. And it was a meeting of the Republican study group and um, the whole sort of think tank infrastructure in Washington. It was held at the Heritage Foundation, but there were representatives from all of the big right-wing think tanks. And they came up with a list. The Wall Street Journal got a hold of the list. It was 32 free market solutions to Hurricane Katrina. And it listed things like, you know, privatize the education system, replace, and, and as we know now, New Orleans is the leading laboratory for privatized education in the country. They've done it. Um, you know, don't reopen Charity Hospital. But it was more than that, because so you hear, have this crisis that was this collision between a neglected public sphere and heavy weather, right? So the solution is, well, let's just finish off the public sphere altogether, right? Let's just close it off. And get this, on the list was drill for oil in Anwar and open more oil refineries on the Gulf Coast, okay? So, you, you, so let's double down on the reason why climate change is happening in the first place. These are solutions. <laughs> um, so I, the first place I presented the, the thesis for the book was, was, was New Orleans um, because that experience had had a huge impact on me and I was invited to this really remarkable conference of people from Asia who had survived the tsunami, um, uh, who had experienced their own forms of, of land grabbing in the aftermath, and, and, um, and they were, me were meeting with Katrina uh, survivors who were dealing with their ho housing um, being privatized and demolished and so on. And, uh, and I talked a little bit at this meeting about, about, the, about the concept of disaster capitalism. And Sakat Sony, who some of you may know, he's a great labor organizer um, in New Orleans. He, he was a founder of the Worker Center there, um, organizing immigrant workers. And he stood up at this meeting and he said, yeah, 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 they've got disaster capitalism. We need disaster collectivism. <laughs> um, and that really stayed with me. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, um, you know, when the shock doctrine came out, you know, the first stage of response was like, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, you know, don't be ridiculous. And then the financial crisis hit in, in 2008, a year after the book was published, and then people started to see exactly this tactic being used, this crisis that was created by our elites um, being systematically used as a weapon against the most vulnerable people, and this was ha happening, you know, most forcefully in Europe, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and people resisted and knew it was happening and, you know, s took to the streets and occupied the squares and said, we won't pay for your crisis um, and knew that this was a tactic, but it didn't work. And I think part of the reason it didn't work is that it isn't enough just to resist. 
this tactic. You need, as Sackett said, your own vision <laughs> for how to transform society in a way that actually gets at the root causes for why these crises and these shocks are happening in the first place. And that, I think, is what progressive movements have, have too often failed to do. You know, we're really good at saying, don't do it, um, but we're less good, or we've become less good at articulating a vision for another way to organize society, one that will really get at those root causes. And that hasn't always been the case. Um, indeed, some of the most important progressive victories of the past have been won in the wake of crisis. If we think about um, the victories of the New Deal period, um, imperfect as they were, were an attempt to get at the underlying causes of the market crash and the vast inequality. Um, so, so what I'm arguing, of, of course, in this book is that climate change can provide us with, in a sense, the infrastructure to respond um, to these serial shocks, to these serial crises that we have coming our way, both uh, ecological shocks and economic shocks. Um, and be prepared for them and advance a transformative vision um, that really changes our economy for the better. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about why we have failed to rise to this challenge thus far, thinking about that 61% emission increase. Um, a lot of theories have been advanced about you know, why it is that, that um, that this crisis has proven so intractable, you know? And we sometimes hear it's just human nature, the problem of climate change is it's too abstract and we're sort of hardwired to respond to an immediate threat but not to a threat that will, you know, unfold decades in the future. And, you know, there may be some truth to that, but, you know, it didn't seem that abstract in New Orleans and it didn't seem that abstract, you know, in New York um, when Wall Street was flooded. Um, but that still hasn't caused us to jump. Um, so there must be something besides this idea that it's too abstract, because it's certainly getting less abstract by the day. Um, we also hear this idea that's just too complicated, right? That how can you get, you know, every country in the world to agree on the rules and it's, you know, it's just impossible. But then you have to remember that we have done this before, not just for relatively simple problems like a hole in the ozone layer, which isn't all that simple, but you know, we did sign the Montreal Protocol and the ozone is recovering. Um, you know, we have done it with weapons treaties, once again, imperfect. But then you have to remember that in this same period that we've been failing to deal with climate change, um, our governments launched the World Trade Organization, which is an incredibly complex systems of of rules and regulations with strict penalties. So it's clear that they can cooperate when they want to um, and when interests align in certain ways. Um, so, so I think there's something else that we don't talk about enough, which is simply that climate change has had catastrophically bad historical timing. By which I mean that scientists have understood the connection between greenhouse gas emissions and warming for a long time, but this issue landed decisively on the public's lap at a very specific moment in time, and that time was 1988. That was the year that James Hansen testified um, on Capitol Hill and said that he now had a high degree of certainty that, there, that warming was beginning and that it was connected to human emissions. Um, that was when it landed on the front page of all the newspapers. That was the year that the editors of Time um, sat down to choose their man of the year. They still had only men of the year at that time. And they made the very bold decision that this, this year, the man of the year for 1988, was not going to be a man at all, but was going to be planet Earth. Um, and they put the planet in peril on the cover. And and, and this was accompanied by a really interesting essay that talked about how the crisis of global warming was not just about pollution, but was about a flawed paradigm that it traced back to the Judeo-Christian dominance 
narrative, Time Magazine, um, and back to Francis Bacon's idea that the earth was a machine and that it was up to man to dominate it, and this replaced the idea of the living earth and the earth mother. This was Time, 1988. So you can understand why the environmental movement was kind of excited, right? And thought like, wow, this is the dawning of a new consciousness, right? They're reading about this in Time magazine, and it really felt like, okay, we're really going to do something about this. And this led to, you know, a few years later, the Rio Earth Summit and the whole concept of sustainable development, which is much discredited. Now, so if we go back and think, what else was happening in 1988, right? Well, that year, the first major free trade deal was signed between Canada and the U.S. that was eventually extended into NAFTA, which became the prototype for dozens of other trade deals. A few years later, the World Trade Organization was born. The year after Hansen testified, um, the Berlin Wall collapsed. Francis Fukuyama declared history over. And this was the triumphant moment um, for what Joseph Stiglitz has called market fundamentalism. And this was the moment where the hard right declared ideological victory and said all other economic models no longer existed. There is no alternative, said Margaret Thatcher. So in most of the world, this is called neoliberalism, right? This country has trouble with the word neoliberalism because it confuses it with liberalism and all of that, right? So, but we know what it is. We know the pillars of this ideology there. Privatization of the public sphere, deregulation of the corporate sphere, um, tax cuts for the wealthy paid for with cuts to public services, um, and all of it locked in through free trade deals and structural adjustment policies um, advanced by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, right? We know this architecture. So, in very concrete ways, all of these pillars clash directly with what we need to do to respond to the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, I, I spend a, a fair bit of time in the book just going through exactly what this means. But I think the, the, the reason why it is worth understanding this is not just to sort of feel hopeless, but to understand that the fact that this ideology has made it so impossible to respond to what our own leaders are describing as an existential crisis, what John Kerry has called a weapon of mass destruction, what Ban Ki-moon describes as the greatest challenge facing the human family. If this ideology is standing in its way, it's the best argument progressives have ever had against this ideology, okay? And you know, I start the book with a chapter called The Right is Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I hang out with um, climate change deniers, you know, at the Heartland Institute and these conferences where these, you know, um, sort of weathermen and um, astronauts and there's just like random dudes, you know, give slideshows and talk about how they've out outsmarted 97% of, you know, atmospheric scientists. Um, and the reason I, I say the right is right is because this movement is not a scientific movement, right? It is a, a entirely a product of the right-wing conservative think tank complex in Washington. The Heartland Institute, which hosts all of these denier conferences, is a free market think tank. It's just like the Heritage, it's just like the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute. And I interviewed the head of the Heartland Institute, Joe Bast, and I asked him how he got interested in climate science, and he said, well, he realized that if it was true, it would justify anything, for anything for leftists to do. Um, so he said, so then I took another look at the science, right? So it's not like he looked at the science and found a problem with the science. He understood that if the science were true, um, then the entire ideological scaffolding on which this whole project rests would fall apart. So they went to try to find holes in the science, and that's what they do, right? They try to find holes, you know, they've cast doubt, and that's been the project. We caught a, little, a, a really dramatic glimpse of this when Britain was flooded last year, um, because under, under David Cameron, who's like a Mr. Austerity, right, um, in Europe, he had 
gutted the agency that is in charge of flood response in the UK. Um, even though, you know, scientist after scientist predicts that this is, you know, going to be the major impact for the UK is going to be increased flooding, increased precipitation. Um, so it's happening. And it turns out a thousand people have been laid off from this agency. Hundreds of flood defense programs have been cut back as part of this broader wave of austerity. A thousand more jobs are on the chopping block. And Cameron's base turns on him in the midst of the flooding, right? And it's just, wait a minute, like we actually, you know, in the midst of crisis, people want their government to have their back, which is actually what happened during Katrina. I remember a, a, a column by Jonah Goldberg, who's like, you know, a hardcore right-wing ideologue. He was like, where's the government? You know, when there's a crisis, you want the government to ride to the rescue. You lose your free market religion pretty fast. And so David Cameron, Mr. Austerity himself, actually made this speech where he said, money is no object. We will spend anything, right? Um, so, I mean, this is just a glimpse of if, I think, it, if progressives we're really looking at this, cri at this crisis and not looking away, because I think we all engage in our own kind of soft denial, um, we would have a really powerful tool against the attacks that are taking place all the time on the public sphere, um, attacks on, um, you know, on frontline services like firefighting. You know, in Greece, the firefighters can't afford spare tires for their fire trucks going in to fight forest fires. Um, so that's just, you know, a clear example, and if we took this crisis seriously, obviously we would be having to make massive investments in the public sphere, both to protect ourselves from the heavy weather that's already locked in, but also to get off fossil fuels, the huge investments we need um, in affordable, good mass transit, light rail, um, and of course the, the, the energy transition, and which I'll talk a little bit about more. The other thing that has been increasingly standing in our way is um, free, those free trade deals. And I'll give you an example close to home from where I live. I live in Toronto now. And um, my government has um, passed actually quite a good green energy plan. It was introduced in 2009 in the midst of the economic downturn. And it was introduced in part to lower emissions. In fact, our green energy plan has the most ambitious emission reduction targets anywhere in North America. We're getting off coal, 100% off coal by 2015 was the target. Um, um, but the, but, but the, the politics of it, the way it was sold, is, was as a job creation program because the manufacturing sector was getting decimated because Ontario was heavily dependent on auto manufacturing, and the big three automakers were bankrupt at the time, um, and it was easier to close Canadian plants than it was to close American plants when you're getting bailed out by Washington. Um, so all of these auto workers were losing their jobs, and, um, and so as part of this green transition was a just transition element, which was that uh, it required that the, any, any energy producer that wanted to benefit from the feed-in tariff, the sub basically subsidized um, energy, had to produce 40 to 60 percent of their goods in the province. So th all of these factories started opening, and there is one factory that I profiled, which was sort of the poster child of this transition, which was a auto parts factory that had closed and reopened as a solar plant. Um, and a whole bunch of workers who had lost their jobs at Chrysler um, and, you know, at Magna, an auto parts maker, got jobs making um, solar panels. So things were going well. 31,000 manufacturing jobs were created in the province. So it was a really successful program. And then um, Germany and the European Union took Canada to the World Trade Organization and said that this requirement that jobs, jobs um, be created locally was discrimination against their companies because, of course, we always knew that these, tr these trade deals were you know, bill bills of rights for corporations. They used this language of discrimination, right? Um, and they won. The WTO ruled in their favor. The Canadian government didn't fight it very hard um, because the Canadian government is much more interested in tar sands development um, than in defending renewable energy projects. 
Um, and this is happening all the time now. Uh, the U.S. has challenged both China and India's renewable energy subsidies, which is just crazy because, of course, if you talk to a lot of people, it's just like, well, it doesn't matter what we do. You know, China's just opening a coal plant a week, you know, and we use this as an excuse for our inaction. And then the U.S. government is going to the WTO and knocking down the windmills in India and China um, at precisely the wrong time. Um, uh, to quote Stiglitz again, um, you know, he, he, commenting on these trade challenges, he said, you know, how absurd that we would be leaving um, such a critical issue to the, uh, in the hands of what he described as silly lawyers, um, you know, who did not even understand this crisis when they wrote the rules. Uh, and yet that's what's happening. Now, I think what that means to us facing a whole new flurry of new trade deals like the TPP, new deals with Europe, China, is that this, once again, is pretty much the best argument we've ever had against these deals that are flawed in countless other ways um, because they literally allow trade to trump the planet itself um, and they need to be fought. So that's, um, that's another example of this clash between one of the key pillars of, of the neoliberal project and what we need to do. Another is privatization, just the, the, the fact that in this key period, our governments have been systematically selling off um, many of the sectors that are most central to any kind of energy transition, like energy, but also transportation, roads, bridges, uh, trains, you know, all of it, right? It would be a lot easier to, to make this transition if we still had control over a lot of these sectors, but of course they've all been sold off. What's interesting, you know, I think probably everybody here has heard, you know, pros and cons about what's going on in Germany. Germany is in the midst of, you know, a tumultuous energy transition since they've um, been phasing out nuclear. Now about 25% of Germany's electricity, not all of its power, but its electricity comes from renewable, a good deal of it from wind and solar, and a whole lot of it is coming from small-scale, um, community-controlled uh, uh, renewable projects, like there are 900 new energy cooperatives pr producing energy and taking advantage of Germany's national feed-in tariff. So this is, you know, you can knock it, and th it's not perfect, and I'm going to come back to it, but it's pretty impressive to go from 6% to 25% in a little over a decade. And the U.S. is still at 4%, even with all the incredible progress that's been going on in, in California and Arizona. Um, so 25%, 4%, pretty good, right? Um, one of the things that we don't hear very much about is that this transition has only been possible because in hundreds of cities and towns across Germany, people have voted to take back control over their energy grids from the private companies that, that bought them in the 1990s. Um, and they've done this because they wanted to switch to clean energy and these private players were standing in their way. They, they, they didn't think that it would be profitable enough, they wouldn't do it fast enough. And so people have voted in referendums in big cities like Hamburg, um, have voted to, to just take their power back. And this is starting, this is increasingly being called remunicipalization, um, and it's starting to happen in the U.S. Boulder, Colorado, same thing happened. You know, it's a green city. Everyone knows Boulder's so crunchy. Everybody wears fleece and bikes, but like most of all of their power was coming from coal. Um, so some young environmentalists went to their private energy provider and said, you know, we want to switch to renewables. We're a green place, um, and the company Excel. Um, wasn't too interested. And so because of that, this movement started in Boulder to remunicipalize the, the, the power grid, to take it back um, and to transition. And what was, what's interesting about that to me is that it isn't being driven by an ideological project. It is being driven, it's not like, the, like these are groups that started off being opposed to energy privatization. They had no problem with it. They thought that they would be able to go to the energy provider and convince them that this was the product that they should be selling. They came to this project um, because it was standing in the way of what they wanted to do, and that's why they, they decided to take back their power. Um, so coming back to 
what isn't working in Germany. So despite the fact that renewable energy is spreading very quickly, emissions are still going up. And emissions are still going up because the German government, though it has been willing to put these, these market mechanisms in place that has in, have encouraged this, this decentralized energy transition, it's not standing up to the fossil fuel lobby in Germany, which is represented by big coal very powerful in Germany, and they actually mine some of the dirtiest coal in the world called lignite coal, so it has even higher carbon emissions. And they have been allowed to continue to expand in this period and even to export as the market starts to dip in Germany, they are exporting their excess um, coal-powered energy. So, you know, this comes, this is really the biggest taboo of all in, a, in the neoliberal era is actually saying no to powerful corporations when they want to make money. Um, and this is obviously one of the big problems in this country where you have Obama who has now spent more than three years just not saying no to the Keystone XL pipeline. I mean, just kind of like waffling around and um, ordering new reviews and things like that. It's clearly very hard to just say no. Um, and and this is where I think um, you're seeing some of the most exciting activism, where in a sense what, 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 what's starting to emerge is as we face this fossil fuel frenzy, in fact, in North America, it's not just that we're not saying no, it's that our governments are saying yes to um, a doubling down on some of the highest risk fossil fuels, the highest emission fossil fuels, transitioning from um, conventional gas to fracked gas, from conventional oil to tar sands oil and shale, um, and now Arctic drilling, deep water drilling. And so they're handing out permits right, left, and center for all of this. And in the face of this, we are seeing what we might describe as a kind of a grassroots regulatory system, um, which is just regular people stepping in to this leadership vacuum and saying no, finding ways to say no, whether with their bodies through direct action um, or whether through civil disobedience or whether through local ordinances against fracking or statewide moratoriums or indigenous legal challenges, all kinds of coalitions are emerging and they are starting to win some very, very significant victories. Um, and even victories that are just delays can end up being turning into significant victories. Um, and there was just uh, uh, news this week that Stat Oil, which is uh, the huge Norwegian state-owned oil company, just canceled or suspended a huge uh, development project that they had in the Alberta tar sands, multi-billion dollar project. Um, and one of the reasons they gave for suspending that investment was uncertainty about pipeline capacity, um, which is a nice way of saying, we don't know if we can get this stuff out of here, right? I mean, Alberta is landlocked, and this is where all of this sort of, this kind of, Sur this surround sound activism that's going on, which is taking on oil trains, um, taking on the every, every pipeline they want to build, um, and also taking on the coal infrastructure, the new coal uh, railroads, the new coal export terminals, taking on LNG terminals. It is starting to really have an impact because it's creating investor uncertainty. Then you layer on top of that, the fact that you have this growing divestment movement spreading um, on university campuses. Are there any people here who are involved in their local divestment movements? Um, in faith organizations, university campuses, city councils, um, and we're starting to see some significant wins, like Stanford divesting um, from coal, um, and, uh, and Quite amazingly, this past week, news that the Rockefeller Foundation um, <laughs> uh, is divesting from fossil fuels. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the potential that I think this movement holds, um, because there's been a lot of debate about, about the strategy of divestment, because it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not like, you know, if Harvard does eventually divest or if the UC system does divest, which I hope that it does, you know, it's not going to bankrupt ExxonMobil. Somebody else will buy Exxon stock. So, you know, let's talk about what is useful about this potentially and, and, and what's not. Um, 
Now, part of what has been holding back the response to, um, to climate change is not just the neoliberal project, but something much deeper. Um, and I think that that is best understood as the extractive worldview, um, the extractivist mindset that is really underneath our entire economic system. Um, the fossil fuel economy has always required sacrifice zones. It has always required sacrificial people and sacrificial places. Um, and that is a system that is intimately tied to racism and colonialism. Um, that is what created the rationale um, for who was considered sacrificial, um, whose bodies were considered disposable, whose lands were considered um, uh, um, worthy of being spoiled. And this system of tucking away, uh, tucking away the toxic front lines of what has always been a toxic economic model uh, is part of what has allowed the response to lag for as long as it has lagged. Um, the fact that so many privileged people um, and privileged centers have been protected from the true costs of our energy from the very beginning. Um, and, and, you know, in a sense, there's this idea that the, hid, that, that, that the hidden, the costs have always been hidden in the sense that we're dealing with the buildup of invisible substances in the atmosphere, and, and that's true. But a lot of it was just hidden because we chose not to look. We chose not to see the refinery in Richmond um, or the impacts um, on indigenous land, uh, of living downstream from mining projects and extractive projects of all kinds. Um, so this has definitely been what has held back the response and what is starting to build some of this resistance, this blockade resistance, is simply the ambition of the fossil fuel project at this stage, where you know, something like fracking is much wider um, than the traditional extractive model. You know, it's, it impacts way more land. Same with tar sands and this whole infrastructure that is being built. Um, and in a sense, you know, one of the, 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 the projects that I profile in the book is this fight going on in Europe over a huge gold mine in Greece, and the company is called El Dorado. And it's, it's interesting, right, because this is, you know, the ultimate imperial name, the conquistadors, and, you know, people in, in Europe are talking about this is sort of like this kind of self-pillage, you know. It, this, the project has gone on for so long that Europe is pillaging itself, right? But the name El Dorado reminds us that this didn't just begin. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the heart of the colonial project. So I think as we think about responses and what a just transition must look like, um, the principle that the communities that have always been on the front lines of this toxic economic model must be first in line to receive the benefits of this transition is a principle that should guide our response. Um, and there's a whole bunch, and, and, and as these um, infrastructure projects are resisted, um, and we start having these victories, like the one I, I've been, ones I've been mentioning against pipelines and so on, one of the things that we're, we're starting to hear a lot from frontline communities is, okay, you know, we can win only so much by saying no, but if we actually want this transition to happen, if we want sustainable wins, we have to start being able to offer something else. <laughs> it cannot simply be no to the mine, no to the pipeline. It, there also has to be a yes. There, has to be, there have to be jobs. They have to be better jobs um, in the next economy. And so um, there's a fantastic campaign that maybe some of the people from Movement Generation are going to touch on a little bit um, called the Our Power Campaign that highlights, I think, six different um, communities that have very concrete 
plans for how to transition to this next living economy that puts frontline communities first in line um, and gives those communities the real tools they need to say no. Um, and this is something that everybody needs to understand is in all of our benefit um, because if these communities don't have options, then the emissions are going to continue, the carbon is going to get dug up, we will only be able to win partial victories until there are real options. And um, <clears throat> a really good example is Richmond, um, where there's been a heroic struggle against the expansion of the Chevron refinery, um, but there isn't going to be the kind of sustained transition until there are jobs in the next economy, jobs for, for, for a lot of people, because Chevron is still the biggest employer. And, um, and there are propo great proposals and a few great examples of solar cooperatives um, in, in Richmond, but they need resources. And there's, a, uh, there's a, a, another great project, a fantastic example of this, called the, um, the put forward by the Black Mesa Water Coalition um, on Lakota Territory, where they've been fighting, once again, a heroic uh, struggle against coal mining um, and coal refining, but then kind of hit that same wall. We can't win anymore until we can offer something else, another source of jobs. And they came up with a, a fantastic proposal to build a utility scale um, solar farm that would be able, you know, would be able to serve like a big city like Los Angeles, um, but it needs funding. And this is where I think the divestment movement holds real potential because it's increasingly being talked about as a divest invest strategy. Um, so it isn't just about taking the money from Exxon, um, but reinvesting that money into the next economy and not just switching from big coal to big green. Um, and because it's fully possible, and there are many examples of extractive green energy of various kinds. You know, you can have a wind farm and take all, extract all the profits from the land that it's on, all of the jobs, all the skills, and that's happening on native reservations across the country. Um, and that's also when you start to get a lot of pushback against renewable energy and what so is sometimes called NIMBY, which is actually just people objecting to outsiders coming um, and extracting yet again. Um, so my hope is that out of this divestment movement, we can start to see serious resources funneled to some of the most innovative projects out there. Um, we're not starting from scratch. There are all kinds of uh, great models. And if we're going to start this transition and show that it's possible, um, we, need to bring it to, we need to bring it to scale. We need to bring it to another level. The other thing about that Rockefeller win that I would just want to highlight is that I don't think that this is just like getting Stanford to divest. I mean, the Rockefellers are a family synonymous with fossil fuels, right? I mean, this is this huge symbolic victory here where you, this is the descendants of Standard Oil, the company that is now Exxon, um, the most profitable company on earth. And Valerie uh, Rockefeller going on television saying, I have a special responsibility precisely because my family fortune comes from oil, comes from the industry that created the climate crisis. I have a special responsibility to fund the transition to the next economy. Now that is true. <laughs> um, but I don't think, I, th I, I, I think the moment to seize at this point is, um, is that this, can't be left to the goodwill of philanthropists. I mean, what she is articulating is a polluter pays principle. And it's, it's wonderful that the Rockefeller Foundation is doing it, but I want ExxonMobil's money. <laughs> um, we need their billions uh, to fund this transition. So I think that there's a, those are a couple things that we can take from um, this emerging movement is one, the, how, thinking about the, how, how we take these resources to fund a real just transition and also um, how we take from these small victories a model for a polluter pays regulatory framework, which is the only thing that is going to pay for the transition that we need on a massive scale. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, Yes, we've got a discussion. Um, 
So here's the good news. Um, by responding robustly to climate change, in line with what scientists are telling us, I really think we have a once-in-a-century opportunity to solve some of our biggest and most intractable social and economic problems. We can create countless good unionized jobs in the next economy. Every dollar invested in renewable energy, in efficiency, in public transit creates six to eight times as many jobs as that dollar does invested in oil and gas infrastructure. Now this is creating those jobs where we rebuild our ailing public infrastructure and that infrastructure can, if designed properly, give us more livable cities, stronger communities, healthier bodies. You're going to hear more about that later on. With these actions, we can go a long way towards closing the grotesque inequality gap that scars our societies and plays itself out in out-of-control out of criminal justice system and institutionalized racism. We can find the money by making polluters pay, whether it's the fossil fuel companies or the bloated defense companies or financial speculators. And to do any of this, of course, we must dramatically reduce the power of corporate money in politics. In short, Serious climate actions give us the infrastructure for a broad-based progressive agenda, and it puts us on a firm science-based deadline, and it tells us we simply cannot afford to lose. Instead of trumping and dis or distracting from our most pressing political and economic causes, climate change has the power to supercharge them with existential urgency. If there's one thing I know for certain, it's that the environmental movement has zero chance of winning this battle against catastrophic warming on its own. No wonky plan about cap and trade or cap and dividend is going to convince the fossil fuel companies to keep trillions of dollars <laughs> worth of carbon in the ground. That is something only a massive, serious social movement has a chance in hell of doing. Rather than the ultimate expression of the shock doctrine, a frenzy of new resource grabs and repression, climate change can be a people's shock, a blow from below. It can disperse power into the hands of the many rather than consolidating it in the hands of the few and radically expand the commons rather than auctioning it off in pieces. And where right-wing shock doctors exploit emergencies, both real and manufactured, in order to push through policies that make us even more crisis-prone, the kind of transformations we must advance would do the exact opposite. They would get to the root of why we are facing serial crises in the first place and would leave us with both a more hospitable climate than the one we're headed for and a far more generous and regenerative economy than the one we have right now. Now, I have to tell you that I'm getting a little bit of pushback from my friends in the environmental movement about this book. <clears throat> and they keep telling me, you know, like, wasn't this problem big enough before you had to make it about capitalism? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm not the one who made it about capitalism, by the way. It was already about capitalism. Um, but here's the thing, it's not as if we're talking about an economy that is working beautifully except for the small matter of rising sea levels. <laughs> we're talking about allowing sea levels to rise in the name of protecting an economic system that is failing the vast majority of people on this planet with or without climate change. This is a system that has already sacrificed a great many people's job security, their right to a good public education, to decent health care, and now that same system is making it clear that it is willing to sacrifice the stability of the planet's life support systems. We simply cannot let them do it. Thank you. In the book, Naomi writes about a resistance that's beginning to boil. And here in the Bay Area, of course, we've got a number of amazing grassroots organizations that are part of that boiling resistance. And Naomi wanted to make sure that, that um, there was a space to learn about them, to know what's going on so that you can get plugged into this movement. So I'm going to invite a couple of people on stage here to talk about how 
um, you can get plugged into this movement. Cynthia Jeanette Munoz Ramos is the immigrant rights organizer with Causa Justa, or Just Cause. Her Her political involvement began as a high school student in Sacramento, where she organized against the criminalization of young people of color. Later, she was instrumental in organizing the large student walkouts and immigrant rights strikes on May Day 2006. She's a recipient of the Fellowship for New California, and she's been involved in various grassroots struggles, and now, again, leads the immigrant rights work at Causa Justa. Uh, Kenton Sankofa has more than 10 years of experience with community-based social justice organizing work with a focus on food justice and African-centered education. Born into a poor, racially segregated neighborhood in Cleveland, he eventually made his way to Michigan State to study engineering, and while there in Michigan, he met the legendary organizer Grace Lee Boggs. He was so inspired by her work that he eventually shifted his education to community development issues. He lives in Oakland with his wife and son. Cynthia Kenton, why don't you guys come on up here and take it away. My name is Quentin Sankofa, and I'm a member of Movement Generation, which is a group of organizers that sit at the intersection of ecology and justice. One of our core beliefs is that the social inequities that we're all too familiar with are a form of ecological erosion. And what do I mean by that? Simply put, what we do to our planet, we do to each other. The violent core of this extractive economy is a manifestation of the violent nature of our social relationships. The insane ideology that says we can dominate, subjugate, and enslave our Earth is the same ideology that justifies mass incarceration and the ex mass incarceration and the existence of a militarized police state. It is the same ideology that says women and their bodies exist primarily to serve the sexual desires of men. To be clear, there is no hydrofracking or mountaintop removal or hydro damming or coal mining without the violent removal of people from place and the ensuing subjugation and or enslavement of their labor. But of course, you all know these things. This is nothing new. In fact, it is so ingrained in our collective psyche that we behave as if it's normal. I mean, it's always been like this right? There's no way to fundamentally change it. We can make it a little better, a little less harmful, but really there is no alternative, as Ms. Thatcher would say. Or is there? As, Na as Naomi so eloquently explained, not only is transition inevitable, but it is here. There are irreversible changes happening right now as we speak. You need look no further than California Central Valley or the water crisis in Detroit, to see that transition is inevitable, but justice is not. Sit with that for a moment. Transition is inevitable, justice is not. With this in mind, I wanna pose the following question to you all tonight. Will we continue to uphold, participate in, and suffer the consequences of this violent extractive economy? Or will we build a just transition away from this economy towards local living economies that restore and repair our relationship with home, place, Mother Earth, and each other? The tension between these two divergent paths are playing out in multiple ways across our planet. I want to take a moment here to speak about one particular place that is near and dear to my heart, a place where this conflict between neoliberal capitalism and ecological justice is on full display. That place is Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is a city that in the last 50 years has gone from being the most important to the most neglected and abandoned major city in this country. At its peak population, Detroit was home to nearly two million people. That's equivalent to the combined population of Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, and San Francisco. Today, though, Detroit is home to less than 700,000 people. 
40% of all of its residents are living below the federal poverty line, which we all know is a conservative estimate of poverty. The situation in Detroit is so bleak that in 2013, the city declared bankruptcy, making it the largest municipality to ever do so in US history. As a result, the state of Michigan appointed an emergency financial manager to oversee all of Detroit's public assets. This goon began a series of violent actions to punish the people of Detroit for problems that are a direct result of neoliberal federal policies. With callous disregard for life, this economic hitman stopped pension payments to thousands of retired city employees, and then, in an attempt to sweeten the pot for privatization, he ordered water shutoffs for 7,000 households that owed as little as $150. How outrageous is this? Water is essential to life. Actually, water is life. So the message is clear. If you are unable to pay or you're behind on your water bill, the state of Michigan will cut you off from life. This is state-sponsored eco-terrorism, my friends. And I'm here to tell you, the people of Detroit have had enough. They are not asking for change or demanding that politicians hear their cries. No, the people of Detroit are engaged in, re in resilience-based organizing, a type of community organizing that encourages us all to come together to create collective actions that meet our social and material needs right now. For example, earlier this summer, at the height of the water shutoffs, Movement Generation traveled to Detroit as part of the Our Power uh, campaign to work in solidarity with the youth of Detroit, the East Michigan Environmental Action Council, and the People's Water Board to transform an abandoned recreation center into a people's hydration station where folks could access water for free. While doing the outreach in, outreach in Detroit, we also learned of another tactic people were engaged in to respond to the insanity of water shutoffs. Apparently, some folks in Detroit are learning how to create duplicate water keys so that they can literally turn people's water back on. Now, is this type of action legal? According to the state of Michigan, no. But was it the right thing to do? You agree with the people of Detroit. So what do we have to say about that movement generation? Well, simply, if it's the right thing to do, then we have the right to do it. Again, if it's the right thing to do, then we have the right to do it. Please join me in welcoming my friend Cynthia, who will bring this discussion home and tell us more about some of the right things that are being done here in the Bay Area to address the question of a just transition. Thank you. So Causa Justa is a community-based organization based out of Oakland and San Francisco, working with primarily Latino and black folks in Oakland and San Francisco, as I just said. I'm a little nervous. Um, our work is focused on developing the leadership of these frontline communities to mitigate the impacts of local and global displacement driven by this extractive economy, capitalism, and its neoliberal policies. The same neoliberal policies that have caused the displacement of people from their homelands are the same set of neoliberal policies that are displacing black and brown communities out of the Bay Area. I wanna share with you about our work and how it's around organizing to building the collective muscle needed for a just transition. Addressing the root causes of the issues and putting as many protections in place for people to stay once we start that transition for people to also thrive and not only participate in conversations, but actually make decisions about their lives, their communities, their cities, their states, this country. 
I want to share a couple of the examples that are local to the Bay Area that have happened and some that are in progress right now that require our collective muscle and our collective work. In 2010, during the foreclosure crisis, tenants were being evicted left and right, most of the time in illegally and all the time not right. Management companies and banks were trying to get tenants as quick as possible to flip the homes for more profit. And one of the ways that they were doing this was by shutting off their utilities. Now, community members in both Oakland and San Francisco organized for months and months to make sure that turning the utilities off would be illegal. Not just because we believed it was right, but because, as Quentin said, it's the right to life. And without it, well, what were we going to do? So folks organized and fought until we were able to, in 2010, fall of 2010, win the right to have utilities on, even if the home was foreclosed, even if the bank owned it, even if there was no owner to speak of. But if the tenant was present and they had a right to stay, then they had a right to water. We are currently fighting for more tenant protections in Oakland as we all understand gentrification is rapidly driving and pushing people out of our cities. And many things need to be in place. One of them and very important ones are to have more tenant protections that protect people from things that we think are basic, like harassment, moldy walls, toilets that don't work, and landlords that come in and harassment with calling the police or calling immigration customs enforcement if they don't move out. This po set of policies is going to the city of Oakland tomorrow at 2.30, so if y'all are around and free, you need to be there. Another fight where we are seeing the leadership of communities needed present in advancing justice and a just transition is around, in Oakland, there's a bus rapid transit system that's being proposed that will go from all the way um, East Oakland, border with San Leandro, to, to the border with San Antonio Park. This rapid system would make and invite more development, and not development that would necessarily just, you know, bring in affordable housing that is needed or more parks, that inherently development is not good for people. And historically, we know that development has displaced people. And so the, the, the folks at Causa Justa, the leaders at Causa Justa fought to the city of Oakland to put resources into supporting leadership and inclusive leadership that not only said, well, we like this or we don't like this, but said we want this or we don't want that. And so we're currently in a process where these members are getting to talk about and decide what is that transition from bus systems that work but don't work as great as we need them to. And with this new system coming in, potential for, for more housing, for more open space, what will that look like and what should that look like? And that is up to the people living in those neighborhoods to say. Our work around immigrant rights is also a very infra important frontline issue here in the Bay as well as globally. With climate change as rapidly as it's happening and not being a thing of if but when, we're seeing that the millions of people that are being displaced continue to increase and will only get higher. And so in the Bay Area, our communities are fighting for basic rights to due process, to housing, to not be discriminated against. And this issue needs to continue to be for, uh, frontline of the issues when we talk about climate justice and the people that have been forced to move and never had the right to stay. Um, in closing, I guess I'd like to say that as our dear friend and comrade uh, Gopal at Movement Generation has said that there's no exploitation of land, water, the environment without the exploitation of labor. And so the fights for justice for immigrants, for the right of black and brown communities to stay in their neighborhoods and to decide what their neighborhoods look like, and the right to unionize, the right to get your fair wages paid, the right to get the back wages that you got stolen paid, the right for dignity needs to be front and center of the climate justice fight.
that the transition is not inherently just, but it is that collective power we're building through organizing for, for basic rights, through the resilience-based organizing in our communities that will make this transition a just, a, a just transition. And that it will require all of us, not just some of us, not only our communities in the front line, but that we will need to take their leadership first. Thank you. conversation with everybody. Um, well, as you guys know, folks in Berkeley are a curious and opinionated bunch. Um, so we've got a number of questions here. I'm going to do my best to um, try to synthesize this because obviously a lot of folks here, and first of all, Thank you so much um, for the really fantastic and thought-provoking questions. We're obviously not going to be able to, to get to all of them, but I'm going to hand the whole stack to Naomi. I think so there's more questions than people. <laughs> I'm going to hand the whole stack to Naomi so she can digest them um, later. I'm going to do my best here to sort of synthesize things into some categories. Um, one thing I, I did want to start by asking, someone's got a question here about the recent march in New York City. Um, and you were there. I think most of the folks, though a couple people in this room were probably there, most weren't. And so um, I would like to start out asking you, um, part of this person's question, um, kind of the, the import of it and the import of it going forward and, and, and has this mechanism of climate awareness um, seen its day? You know, how, mm -hmm. how effective was it? Yeah, so is, my, is this mic still working? Okay. Um, First of all, thank you both. Those were amazing um, speeches, and it was so great to have your perspective. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to get too carried away with, with, with what just happened in New York, but it, it really did, it really was one of the most exciting <laughs> um, political experiences of my life. Um, and I say that as someone who mostly gets depressed after going to environmental protests. <laughs> um, it, was, it was really surprising how different it felt. It was, yeah, like everybody's talked a lot about how huge it was, and it was huge, it was huge. It was, it was maybe the biggest demo I've ever participated in. Um, and that was, but that was not what was so cool about it. Um, it what was so amazing about it is that it, it looked and felt like New York City. Um, in all the best of New York City, uh, in all of its diversity. And um, it was not a bunch of sort of slick NGO brands. Like the, the, I was in Copenhagen in 2009, which was, up until this point was the largest climate demo, right? The goal of this demo was to be bigger than the, the Copenhagen demo, which was 100,000 people or something like that. And this was maybe 400,000 people. But the thing about Copenhagen is that it was, it, was, it was basically a march of NGOs, you know, playing beach ball with the earth, you know. Um, and you know, there, there, were, there were elements of it that, 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 that were not that. But that big demo was, was, you know, was that. And I think when you talk to people about why they feel so hopeless about climate, including environmentalists, what they say is that even the, even the people who say they care about climate change don't care that much. It always ranks like below other issues, right? And so that's what makes people feel hopeless about this issue is that it's never going to rise to being like the number one issue except for a small coterie of people um, who like up to this point have a lot of them have been kind of professionalized in that world. And the, the glimpse that I think that New York March provided was what an actual climate justice movement would look like. And it had so much more of a sense of urgency. Um, and you know, the, the, the investment of communities that, that were there because they were decimated by Sandy and were still 
you know, had not, it was still waiting for reconstruction or dealing with gentrification, or you had, you know, a big contingent from the South Bronx who, you know, had made these amazing banners about soaring asthma levels, um, you know, or the anti-fracking movement who are dealing with water safety issues. So you had all of these very personal connections to the issue that was, you know, that, that brought it down to earth from that sort of astronaut's eye view. And that's why I think this issue of like, why does justice matter, right? I mean, justice matters because it's justice, but also it matters because only justice will fuel a movement willing to fight, right? People will fight for that better future um, in a way that this sort of abstracted climate movement, I'm sorry, will never fight to win. You know, people will fight for their kids' health. They will fight for the jobs they know they deserve. They will fight for water, right? Um, and I think, you know, when we face these questions of like, well, do we really want to connect it to all these issues? Like, this is the only way we'll win, you know? And that, I think, people caught a glimpse of. So there's a, there's a couple of questions here I'll sort of bleed together that I'd love to hear all three of you guys tackle. Um, and, and the first part is a key part of your, Naomi's argument, is that climate change is, is not only tied to capitalism, but to these, you know, larger systems of power and institutions that, that are, you know, per per perpetuating a given ideology. And, and given that, um, uh, and, and that it's really a systems battle, you know, how do you make change at that scale? And then this is kind of a sub-question I thought was interesting. Are small pockets of collectivity and autonomy even a problem for capitalism? If they were, wouldn't it be the job of the state to just crush them? I guess the point there is, you know, urban farms are great, but if they were really threatening big ag, big ag would come in and get rid of them. So I guess the question is, you know, how do we make change on the scale that's required and not be um, in, in these pockets? So why don't we, you know, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's a very complicated question. And the way that I would, I would approach it is to say that it's not necessarily, in this example, the urban farm that's gonna confront the power system, but it's the coming together of people at the right time to do the right thing. Whether it be an urban farm, whether it be uh, occupying a foreclosed property, it's our collective will to say, you know what, we have power. A lot of times we come from a, def a deficit mentality. A lot of us grow up without access to resources and power, and we bring that to our social movements and act like we don't have any power and that we're always fighting power to do something on our behalf. But we have to realize that we do have the power to engage in collective action. That's what's the most important thing is our collective action. So not an individual. So no, an individual won't be able to, to challenge this system in that way. If you want to, uh, you know, shop for environmentally friendly products or do your own thing, yeah, that's great. But it's not going to just be you. It has to take the collective will of everybody, a mass movement. And once we reach that scale, which I believe we're doing, we're just not getting the coverage to do it. But once we reach that mass scale, then we will see the changes in our communities. I guess what I would add is that um, capitalism is in concerned with people and how and their well-being and the well-being of our communities. Capitalism is concerned with develop making more capital, and so when we think about even those small pockets of organizing as they continue to build resilience and communities are very critical and important because that is us saying there is another way. Capitalism and the development of capital isn't the way we wanna go. The way we wanna go, our vision for a different world is where we ourselves as human are developing the abilities to sustain ourselves, to feed ourselves, to build our own, to have a community where it isn't about what job you're doing, but as Michelle would say, what is the role that I play in my community? What is the role that's there for me? Because we will need everybody. Um, and I think that is the exciting part about even smaller pockets as they continue to build, and that we need that translocal work, that it can't just be local, it needs to grow and build, but also continue to stay um, held and developed in community for you know, generations to come. I would, I would just add that, I mean, the reason why I talk about Germany for all its flaws is that I think it's an example of um, a model that combines 
scale and decentralization. Um, because I think that, you know, this is not about reverting to centralized state solutions that um, create big alienating structures that are no less, no more accountable than corporations. Um, it's, and, and, and so I think what is exciting about that German transition for all its flaws is that they have de designed a national policy that um, is systematically decentralizing power that um, where you have hundreds of energy co-ops, hundreds of municipally democratically controlled energy utilities, um, and you are keeping resources in the community, um, and you are deepening democracy. So I think we need to we need to talk about those models that marry this desire for local power and control and sovereignty with the scale of change that we need. And, the, and again, this is a good one for, for all three of you. So speaking of narratives, who do you turn to for new visions and stories? And, and I guess sort of my own follow-up to tack onto that is you've got this nice line in the book about how we have to dream in public. So what is, you know, the first question is sort of where do you, you know, turn to for those visions and the stories, the inspirations, and then how do you kind of manifest them by, as, as Naomi puts it, dreaming in public? I'm a community organizer, so that's where it starts. People come together and they say, this is not what we need, this is not what we want, this is not how we envision our lives to be, and we can dream of more. And so that inherent resilience and imagination and visioning for what's possible and making the impossible possible is very much a part of my day-to-day -day work. Um, so I think that would be it for me. Yeah, and I would just say that, I mean, I, and I, I really am so happy that we're, we're able to do this event together with Movement Generation because I think that they are one of the best examples of, of an organization that, um, that, 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 um, that, that honors this storytelling tradition, you know, um, and this collective storytelling process that I find, you know, really inspiring. Um, and I, I do think that there is this thing breaking down between, um, you know, I think maybe I'm wrong, and I know there are people in this room who can definitely correct me, but that in the 60s, um, there was this sort of tension between the like resistance folks and the dropout folks, you know? Like the people who were having the fight in the streets and the people who like went to start the farm and were like, okay, I'm gonna go start my utopia. And I come from that sort of like, you know, my family are draft dodgers, so we ca they came to Canada. There's a lot of people who like kind of dropped out in the Gulf Islands and all of that. But one of the things that I think is really happening in this stage in our history is that the extractive project is so ambitious that even the people who dropped out are having to join the resistance again because like the oil freight train is coming through their beautiful little green world, you know? Um, and so, <laughs> but I think it's kind of exciting too because, um, you know, I, I think that the communities in resistance are saying we can't just resist, we also need our alternatives or we won't win. And the communities that have been building a lot of like the most exciting alternatives are also coming back in the fight. And there's a really nice cross-pollination happening. I look at my son and he has a beautiful story to tell me about what he wants to, to happen in the future. He can't even talk yet, but I can see through the way he interacts with the world. <laughs> What, what should life be about? It should be about love, it should be about freedom, it should be about the ability to define your reality and not have others define it for yourself. So I think the role of culture is very important and what we've done in Movement Generation is make it intentional and deliberate that we involve culture in our movement. For a long time, uh, we've kind of just been out there fighting, 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 and we haven't been engaging with our uh, ancestral wisdom, we haven't been returning to stories, we haven't been uh, giving uh, stories the power that they, they actually deserve. Like, when you do oral history projects, sometimes historians balk at that and say, oh, well, people just talking. Well, that's the way we communicate, and that's the way stories gain traction and power. And uh, as Naomi said in her book, The Writer is Right, that's what they're doing. They're shaping our culture every day. So that's why it's really easy for them to, to you know, sneak a, a freight train through our neighborhood at night because they've created the, the dominant narrative around culture and around, you know, access to resources that a lot of 
that type of thing to happen. But what we want to do is we want to look to each other and we want to pull the best of our collective thinking and our ancestral wisdom to say, what do we need in this moment and what's going to inspire us to pick up, uh, to pick up and, 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 and make this world happen? Because we have to create it. It doesn't exist. So we, we need old stories and we need new stories. So I'm glad, Quentin, that you, I'm glad, Quentin, that you brought up, uh, you know, shaping culture and shifting culture, because there's a number of questions about that, which will kind of first throw to you, Naomi, because they're specific to what you're working on, but I'd love to hear everybody's take on that. Um, one person is kind of curious, you know, how do you balance the development of your, of your books in, in making sure that you're going to be able to reach that? And the person says, I ask because your books, although amazing, seem to be far too long to reach the audience who needs your work. And then kind of on a... But it's, yeah, I guess it is a question about how do you communicate, right, in a country of yeah. 300 million people, and, and Naomi is Canadian, so now we're talking North America, 330 million people, and, you know, again, internationally, and, and sort of on the same tip, um, Shoshana wonders, you know, I saw you on the Colbert Report and felt very disappointed, um, basically just because the important message seemed lost. Um, I'm wondering how do we translate this radical and important shift in consciousness um, so that it's received with the serious it deserves. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, Colbert is its own thing, but yeah, I mean, how do you kind of take these big ideas and, and um, as it were, kind of bleed them out into the, into the mainstream? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, well, it is a crazy process of like, right, you know, spend five years writing a 500 page book with 70 pages of footnotes and then, you know, make a fool of yourself for five minutes on the Colbert Report about it and hope, you know, that, you know, some people might read it. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I sort of have a pretty um, all of the above strategy <laughs> to quote, um, a very bad energy policy, um, <laughs> and, uh, about getting ideas into the culture. I mean, I think, I think that getting ideas into a really dense culture, just information-saturated culture such as ours at this point, fractured attention spans, is really, really hard. And we've, we've put a lot of thought into it for this project. Um, it's, you know, I think books do reach a certain constituency, and for the people who still like to read books, um, it's, there's, you know, I guess, like, I still believe in books, and I still believe in taking the time to, um, to just sort of sit with a subject that kind of demands that amount of time, and, um, but I know it's not for everybody, and I know that it's it, that it's limited. Um, I I still think that it's about for me like a lot of it is about like strengthening the people who are in this fight with ammo. I always think about my books as movement ammo. Um, I know that I'm not supposed to say that because it's you know that's, that sounds like preaching to the choir, but. Um, I actually just think it's important that we, you know, like I, I feel like it's a real privilege for me that I am able to spend years on a project in a culture that doesn't give people the time to do that anymore. I mean, journalists are so overworked and this pressure to produce, produce, produce. I think there's way, like people write too quickly without enough research. So I'm in, a, you know, a very, very privileged position that I can take five years to write a book. I have researchers, fact checkers, we can nail it down. And I don't know why I feel the revolution should be endnoted, but I, I feel like it helps a little bit once in a while to have this sort of text. Um, but but that's, not, that's not enough in and of itself. I think that that plays a kind of a specific role. What, what we're doing differently with this project is thinking about how do we um, how, do we, how do we come at it in a whole bunch of different ways at once? We've been talking with Movement Generation for years now about how we roll ideas, how we roll ideas out. And we, my, my partner, Avi, has been making a documentary film on this topic at the same time as I've been doing the book that I think will reach a completely different constituency, including people who don't um, read 500-page books. And we've also been working with um, fantastic radical educators at Rethinking Schools and the Zen Education Project. Project. And they're actually having a retreat with educators to develop 
curriculum um, for high school students based on the book to like, you know, to break it down. Um, and then once the film is out, we are going to do a, um, a, a series of, of teach-ins um, and, 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 and sort of events that, you know, I mean, I think that this night is like the tiniest taste of. It will be totally different, but it'll be about bringing the voices of the movements who are doing the work front and center um, and creating spaces that are not, you know, up, 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 up on stage, but much more level to have this discussion. We had a meeting during the climate march because so many different groups were in New York. Um, we had about 40 or 50 community groups represented to just workshop this idea. We took four hours on a, the, the day before the march. It was really great and just talked about, okay, so how do we do this? Like, how do we, how do we, how do we create movement spaces around ideas? And, and, um, and some really cool ideas came out of it. The idea that I, that I was most excited about actually was having a gathering about the idea of reparations um, that bridges the discussion around reparations for slavery and colonialism with climate. Um, and, um, you know, that just came out of just brainstorming. Um, but, you know, one of the things we hear from community groups is people, and, and I'm, I, you know, I, I think maybe you hear this too, is like people still feel a need for some basic climate education. Um, and a lot of what makes this world really exclusive is just like there's so much jargon in it. It's, it's just like you've got the science jargon, the policy jargon, and the UN jargon. And when you layer it all together, it's just like repels people. Um, and so, you know, just getting back to basics of like, okay, how does, how does, this, how, how does this thing work, you know? And how do we make people feel confident to, to be part of this discussion? Um, so, long answer. I don't know, I write books out of habit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, reaching folks um, on the ground level is something that we specialize in. And we have a saying, the movement generation, what the hands do, the heart learns. And we have a whole host of programs that put us right in line with communities working on these issues. And we don't have to bring the jargon because people know there's something fundamentally wrong with the way life is right now. Everybody's working too much, feeling, feeling stressed out, not getting paid too much, rent is going up, wages are stagnant. So people feel the pressure. They might not know what it has to do with climate or the economy, but they know that something's not right. So um, one thing that we, we, we do is we lead with vision. And so we talk about what can be, what the possibilities are, you know, like, hey, wouldn't you like to work less and spend more time with family? That sounds fantastic. So let's do that, right? So, so when, when, you, when you start to grab people's attention just based off of where they're, where they're at, you know, like one of the things uh, one of my comrades does, uh, Carla, is she organizes a healing, uh, a healing clinic for women and now for men as well who are not getting their needs met by the industrial medical complex. And so she brings together all of these different healers that practice all types of traditional uh, methods and, you know, more new age, modern methods. But folks know that they're not getting their needs met through the traditional system. And when you come to them and say, hey, I have a different way to do it, they're responsive to that. And then you can start talking about other things. And then the other thing I do with people, I just sit down and turn on Captain Planet and we just talk about it. Captain Planet. Yeah, that goes a little, you know, that's for my younger folks in the audience. I grew up on it. You know, Ted Turner made this cartoon back in the uh, early 90s. It was really funny if you uh, check it out now. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll add very exciting projects that we've had at Causa Justa around um, people learning about art and art making and printmaking for liberation, right? For telling their own stories, for telling their own visions of the world. And we've had um, in the last five years, two sessions, one that resulted in many really amazing prints about displacement and gentrification and immigrant rights um, in San Francisco. And one of them is a really beautiful mural that you if you go back to the Mission District, you'll see it. It's of a mom on one side and her child on the other side of a fence. Um, with She's holding a mic, and it's sort of this, like, illustrating the tragedy of migrant um, rights issues right now and displacement, but also illustrating the power that she has to continue to advocate for herself and organize for change. And we recently just had another series where folks came up with a really exciting 
uh, t-shirt design, and it's also a print um, that was around fighting gentrification and how our, neighbor, our neighborhood is not for sale, um, and advancing that, and it was towards advancing our right, our fight right now currently around tenant protections to protect people and mitigate the impacts of development that has come into Oakland that hasn't been for people. Um, and so we think that culture is a really important part of the day-to-day -day work, the popularizing of ideas and of really uh, visualizing that vision, the making real and visible to others the vision that we have for, for our world. I love those answers, right? Because we got, we got books, murals, cartoons, <laughs> um, t-shirts, you know, it. it goes all to show all, all the ways to, to, to shift culture. We're just going to do one more question again. I, I regret that we could not get to everybody's questions, but I really appreciate all the thoughtfulness that was put into them. Um, please do buy the book in the lobby. Um, it's a fantastic book. Book Sync is out there signing the book. And then Naomi will be up here on stage signing copies. So the last question is, and this is, you know, they always say this is the Commonwealth Club, um, and, and they've underlined single. What's the single most important thing we humans can do to protect our biosphere, and I'll add on to that, and promote social justice. So single thing, you got, you got one thing. It's underlined here. The single. Yeah, let's let Naomi have the last word on this. Oh. <laughs> um, do you have something that comes to mind right away, the single thing? I can't hear that great. The single. Sing, what's the single, basically, the single, the single thing to, to save the biosphere? You know, oh, I, Recycle, I, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> recycle, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Um, I think it's phone. ecology. I think it's ecology. <coughs> and at Movement Generation, we always remind folks that eco comes from a Greek word oikos, which means home. Logi meaning knowledge. So having a knowledge of home. Once we have a knowledge of home and we refine our knowledge of home, then we're not going to let people come through bringing all types of madness through our home and mm -hmm. understand that we own that and we should yeah. live in that and, and have that sacredness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that organizing for that right to ecology, to manage our own home, is the single most important thing to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was looking for something to read along those lines, but my, um, um, I think that's a great, that is a great note to end on. Um, I think the, 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 the era of the single act, the change your light bulbs, the drive a hybrid, the recycle, the write your Congress, whatever, um, you know, we're beyond that. We need to build movements. We need to build movements again and act collectively. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.